on it, on top of it, over it. Oh no, that was something else. Ah, as you can see, today is Thai Day. And why is it Thai Day today? Today is Thai Day because we have episode 25 of the Workshop Watch. Hmm, that reminds me of 25, a quarter hundred, a quarter hundred is full, and that is important because, because I will only create a 100 episodes of the Workshop Watch, the first quarter I am through with. Now you can have fun and enjoy this episode in which you will see me exclusively wearing a tie. <laughs> tie day. Workshop Watch. Here in the museum, we build aeroplanes, restore cars and motorbikes, file, weld, hammer and tap, wander, weld and plane some more. And they say that where you break an egg, chips fall. And that's what you're going to see here. And off he goes again! Welcome to episode 25 or part 13 of our documentary on how to build the Fokker V40 as the Engels E7. Today is Thai Day and we show you building the second wing. How accurately do you have to work? What's behind Fokker's ingenious design principle? Philip, the new guy in the workshop. Fitting the aileron spars, sawing large plywood sheets, conversation during wing construction, Matze's petrol tank construction, more new faces, guest workers, clever talk, mounting the nose paneling, and as a crowning final, shots of the maiden flight of Paolo Severin's large scale model of the Engels E7 in 1 to 3rd scale. Have fun in the next hour. Food is important, you know that. Without munching, no fighting. And today we'll have pizza. Mm -hmm. 350 degrees Celsius. That looks good. Well, let's shovel in that stuff. Mmm, <laughs> smells good. <laughs> Soon. All right, this has to be it. Otherwise, it'll burn. And who wants burnt pizza?
Dag net! Last time you've seen how we slid the ribs onto the wing spars. They have to be secured now. And we have to create the cutout in the wing that allows the big belly of the pilot to slide through when climbing into the cockpit. And this is being laminated here. Of course, everything has to fit perfectly in aircraft construction. Otherwise, it doesn't work. It doesn't fly. Some people, Martin pointed it out to me yesterday during a conversation. Some people believe they can never do that because it always is way too precise. They believe their skills are not good enough to get those things done. I'll fetch the other camera and show you something. I will provide you with a little lecture right now, but that's important sometimes. Just to show you what vintage aircraft building, especially in the home built sector, is all about. It was a rather interesting discussion I had yesterday in the evening with Martin. Um, how do I do it now? We talked about what some people think how immensely complicated the building of an airplane is, just because everything has to fit so perfectly well. We talked for instance of metal parts when they were turned or created on the lathe or forged or filed, fit so precisely. And eventually, when they get painted, another two tenths of a millimeter of paint sit on top of them and the pieces don't fit together anymore. The parts then can't be either assembled nor do they move any longer. There have to be certain gaps and tolerances in those parts, otherwise you can't assemble them. The same of course applies to wing building. See, the ribs for instance. Of course do they have a certain shape. And of course they have to line up. And of course the continuous flow of shape shifting must be kept over the entire wingspan. But when they are pulled onto the wing spar, it must not be on a tapering spar that the gap exactly is as wide as it has to be in the position where the rib eventually comes to rest. A certain gap is required to move the ribs around, to adjust them, to line them up. Them spars are planned by hand. They are not 100% uniform to the tip. They've never been. Even back in those days they haven't been. They are handmade. That is, in fact, a misbelief. Many are hooked on, especially when they are beginners and doing their first airplane as a home build. It doesn't work that way. I need a certain play in my parts. And to make that clear I show it to you here in this location. As you can see there is a gap between the rib web and the spar. And this is a requirement. The gap can be as big as 2-3 millimeters. You need this as a manufacturing tolerance. Finally, the triangular strip will cover it all up and join the rib with the wing spar. And since the rib web is only one millimeter thick plywood, any gap that may result will be filled up with glue anyway. Any gap eventually possibly coming up between rib web and wing spar is only one millimeter thick and will be filled up with glue, whatever kind of glue you use anyway. So it will be a strong joint, no matter what. So if anybody decides to build an airplane, he shall do it. This is not meant to encourage anybody to work inaccurate. Of course not. He needs to know himself what is important with regards to measurements and their keeping in. And he needs to know by himself what parts need to have a certain play in order to allow them to be fit together even if they have built months apart. It does not work even in modern times that you use CAD or laser cutters and cut everything to the tenth of a millimeter accurate and hope that you can assemble it eventually. Everybody may try it by himself, but I can guarantee to you in 99% of all the cases it just doesn't work. What we do here is functional work. Those pieces have to function. The strength required 
must be provided. The fit that is required must be guaranteed. But I need my tolerances, I need the play in my bits and pieces to allow me to assemble them eventually. That is just a side note here. Martin yesterday told me, you make people afraid of building airplanes because all you do is so perfectly nice and accurate. Nothing I do is over accurate. Everything is just as accurate as it needs to be in order to make it work. That's no witchcraft. That's no magic. There's no enchantment. It's handcrafting. Period. I have prepared everything on the left wing side to secure all the ribs on the wing spars. We've just talked about how ingeniously Fokker, uh, the, did we talk about it? Uh, we haven't talked about it. I wanted to talk to you about it. Yep, we talked about accuracy. Uh, what I originally wanted to say was something different. I have done there, uh, yeah, confused.com. The left wing side is now prepared to receive all the triangular wooden stringers that hold the ribs in place on the wing spar. And there is something to say about it. Fokker was an ingenious aircraft designer. Well, whether it was him or his engineers is another matter, which is not a topic right now. Fokker was able to kill two birds with one stone with his ingenious design. The way in which he constructed his wings from the end of 1916 and then in 1917-18, EI with the introduction of the Fokker D6 and the D7 enabled him to do something special. His cantilever wings, the first experiments with which took place on the Fokker V1, about which we have also written a book that you can find here, there he used these thick wing profiles in aircraft construction for the very first time and they in turn allowed him to do something very special. And the aircraft manufacturers of the Entente powers didn't understand this for a very long time. Until the late 1920s and early 1930s, they didn't realize what Fokker and Junkers had achieved with these thick wing profiles. These wings are not geometrically inclined. Geometric camber means that the ribs of the wing tip have a different angle of incidence than the ribs of the wing center section. This is intended to slightly improve the stall behavior of the aircraft in flight. Forgive me for saying this to the aerodynamics experts among you, but I'm trying to explain it in a way that someone who has never heard of aerodynamics will understand. The profiles are curved at the top, more so than on the underside. Why an aeroplane flies should not be my topic right now. However, due to the curvature during certain flight maneuvers, I show this here using the example of the wing rib of the Fokker D7, the flow then should be present here can no longer be present. It breaks off and vortices and lift is lost and as a result the aircraft then falls out of the sky. To put it simply, so, to counteract this, flat profiles, as they used to be, are turned outwards. I.e. their setting angle is changed. This twisting causes the flow to break off on the inside first while it remains constant on the outside. This means that my lift remains constant here and the ailerons on the outside remain effective for longer. Fokker has solved this problem differently. Fokker has a special feature due to the height cross-section. The spars taper outwards in height, which means that the profiles also taper. So here we have the profile of the wing tip of the D7 and here that one of the inner area of the wing. Now both taper towards each other in height. The profile on the underside remains the same on the outside and the rib remains at the same angle of incidence on the spars up to the wingtip. They are therefore not twisted outwards to change their shape so that the airflow remains in contact with them. They also remain the same in the wing depth. However, the height decreases and this stretches the camber on the upper side. And this stretching if you superimpose it here, means that the flow remains in the outer area for longer. This means that the aircraft 
has a more docile slow flight behavior and remains controllable for longer, even though the flow on the middle area has long since stopped and the aircraft stalled there. And all this without deforming the rib in such a way that my index drag increased towards the outside, which reduces the overall speed of my airplane in turn. Very basic aerodynamics, nothing you need to know, just so that you have heard it one time. However, this led to the Fokker T7 being rumored by enemy pilots to have been hanging on its propeller shooting down other planes. Just like a phenomenon, they said. Anyways, what they reported seeing was not a hanging on the propeller, they have been misled by the fact that the airplane simply remained controllable in high angle of incidence due to this wing design compared to their own aircraft. And all that while their airplane in increasing incidence at the same angles already entered the stall much earlier, lost alien control and simply dropped out of the sky much sooner than the Fokker D7 did. This was a huge advantage for a fighter airplane of course. The Fokker D7 combined agility with relatively stable and soft flying characters, allowing even rookie pilots to achieve success with it. And now comes the true point I wanted to make from the start. The construction advantage when I am assembling such a wing comes with that design. Fokker not only achieved a huge aerodynamic advantage over enemy or competitive airplanes, but this also allowed a relatively or much faster serial production than any other aircraft of World War I. He didn't need special jigs to hold his wings in in order to build them twisted in the required shape so that they fly eventually like he wanted. He could simply put his spars, which were massive, on trestles or straight tables like I do here, make sure they are not twisted against each other. They were rigid enough to remain straight, even over the entire wingspan length. They remain straight and untwisted compared to each other to the wingtip. And when the ribs are pulled onto such a system and the undercamber of the air airfoil is the same all the way to the wingtip, all I have to do is put a straight line underneath them and the entire geometry of the wing provides itself. That means once the ribs are adjusted in the system and glued to the wing spars, the aerodynamic inclination of the wing towards the wingtip is generated automatically and nobody can do anything wrong. That's a simplification of mass production others only can dream of. Fokker and Junkers both did it that way and once you've understood that you realize how simple it is to actually build a Fokker aircraft. Those two, Fokker and Junkers again, way ahead of their time. And now I show you how the wing ribs are secured to the spar by means of the triangular corner gusset, wood strips or whatever. We talked about how it is once the ribs are slid on and uh, have that little gap that uh, actually enables you to adjust them on the wing spar. Let me show it to you once again from here, maybe the light is better. You can clearly see the gap on the adjusted wing rib. This will be closed and covered up with glue and the triangular corner gusset. Like so, oh upside down, well like that, uh, sometimes it drops, happens. Anyways, as you can see, I've laid out with a pencil where it has to come to rest and this area is then glued and eventually it looks like this nice, uh, well, nice is relative with the Aerodux 185. Here a little bit about wood quality. This principle is a very nice stringer. And then suddenly this comes. See? That's a null. 
There was a twig growing. We can't have that. We can't use that. If we would use that, we would increase the risk of having the stringer breaking. So we cut out these bits and use the stringer only in positions like from there on. I told you before, but I do it again. This is a museum that has an understanding of teaching people how things are done and therefore people often come and ask whether they can participate and work with us. Yes, they can. Here is one of them. And if you'd like, you may introduce yourself to the audience. Gerne. Ich bin Philipp, ich bin 21 Jahre alt und arbeite gerade eben bei Schempert. Ich mache eine Ausbildung zum Leichtflugzeugbauer und in meiner Freizeit tue ich Segelfliegen und helfe den Hachim beim Flugzeugbauer. And why are you doing this? Ja, weil ich mich dafür brennt interessiere und gerne meine Hobbys so auslebe und Zeit investiere. Now that's very commendable. There's not many young people out there who use their time this way. And now he's helping with the V40 wing. And he's not exactly clumsy. I think I'll let him come more often. <laughs> the ribs are now secured. The center cutout bow on top or over the cockpit is also put in place. And now the aileron attachment spar can be attached and mounted to the rear ends of the outermost ribs. And this is then oversized, of course, and will be planted down with a long plane. That's another tedious process, since the plane is just a very fine, so that you don't cut off too much and don't cut or don't run into the risk of cutting into your rib ends, which would be not so good. And in the end, the ribs are absolutely flush with the rear aileron mounting spar. Sometimes it happens that you have to cut big, floppy, uh, not very handy big sheets of veneer or plywood. I used to do this with my fine table saw. Um, it makes very straight and very fine cuts and doesn't fray the plywood. Could be done faster with a bandsaw, but it, the plywood does fray with that one and I don't have enough space around it to put the big plates through. Seen here is Martin and myself cutting one of those big plates just to show you how I do it. Sometimes the little saw gets stuck but that's rather more a user fault than the machine ones um, and uh, you can see that it cuts rather nice and what we're doing here is the laminations for the wingtip bows which will be glued up in one of the next steps. I have mentioned it in earlier episodes of our workshop watch already but will remind you again here. Sometimes sequences may appear rather long and unnecessary but the idea behind this workshop watch is to give people an idea of how much work actually and how much time actually goes into the making of these things and sometimes you have work to do of which you don't see much but they eat up time in an immense way. So for those who are not interested in seeing how anybody is cutting wood, move on, nothing to see here, just uh, 
click a few minutes forward.
And those are going to be new tip bows for the wing tip of the V40. It's merely a few weeks ago when we did the other ones for the other wing. Already the next day the wing is flipped over and the underside triangular wooden stringers are glued and tacked alongside the ribs to fix them to the wing spars. And again, it's Philip who helps me with this job. Yeah, Ja. Und dann kannst du sie wie einen Anhänger ziehen. <lacht> Wenn du also gar nicht weit weg vom Flugplatz wohnst, brauchst du keinen Stellplatz auf deinem Flugplatz, sondern bringst du sie jedes Mal mit, baust sie vor Ort auf, das sind vier Bolzen, du musst nichts einmessen, ist alles schon einjustiert. Ja. Also eigentlich für ein kleines Sportflugzeug günstig. Das ist ein ideales Ding. There were other people who tried the same. There is for instance, I don't know if you have ever heard about it, the so-called Pietenpol Air Camper. Bernard Pietenpol was a man in the 30s who wanted to create a cheap and simple to build light sports aircraft for the average man. He designed it in 1928 and the prototype, as far as I know, flew for the first time in 1932 or 33 or so. And there's quite a number of them that have been built in the meantime in the United States and now also in Germany a few, using his drawings as a base, as home-built aircraft. It's also small and lovely, looks even a bit like the Focal V40, but is a two-seater and aerodynamically not as advanced and the structure is a bit more complicated and labor-intense to make than the V40. This is a calm and chilling work. There's always time for some talk. Okay. Hat er eine Liebe zum historischen Flugzeugbau gefunden irgendwie? Irgendwie. 
unverständlich so. Okay. Dann ja. beim letzten Bastelabend Freitag mit seinem Vater da. Ja. Okay. Ganz spannend fand ich. Darf ich hier vielleicht? Vielleicht tut er hier. Naja, warum nicht, gell? Passt doch. Mhm. So, du bist in den Tanks, oder? Ja, irgendwas halt, ja. Irgendwas halt. Hast du halt auch umgebaut? Nein, natürlich nicht. Ja, passt dann. <lacht> nee, dann müssen wir es anders machen. Ja. Wir können das hier anders machen. Ich bin flexibel. Gut, ich auch. Pass auf, dann erkläre ich ihm das und du machst mit meinem Becher weiter. Jo, alles klar. Schöner Flügel geworden, ja? Mhm. Ich freue mich, wie hoch geht das. Ja. Ein. 3, 4 auf dieser Seite noch. Das kann ich auch noch verbinden. So, Matze! Dann machen wir das nämlich so. Das ist der Herr Ingenieur lernt. Ein Blatt Papier. Das Simple rule is you tell the material what it has to do, not vice versa. Nailing was done to fix the parts and to provide the necessary pressure during the setting of the glue. There was no other reason for nailing. You could have clamped it or the nails could have been pulled out again eventually. There's no reason for them to stay in but nobody of course went through the hassle and took out a thousand of nails per wing. In the 30s and 40s they started to use nailing strips. Nailing strips are thin wooden strips through which they nailed. And once the glue is set, they used this strip to pull out the nails again. Leaving small holes, of course, but they don't bother. At that time, it was done that way because what they used were mainly steel or iron uh, pins and tags. Uh, not brass, because brass is heavier and more expensive to obtain. In the early days they left the iron pins in, because if you have a rotten nail in it or a hole by pulling it out, doesn't matter, it doesn't hurt the wood anyway. And we did the calculations for this wing, we need about 4200 nails, and the nails we use would come up with about around 100 grams, so it doesn't matter much, you can leave them in. We have not yet done uh, engineering drawing for the fuel tank. That means that Matze has to go over on the existing fuselage frames, has to check with all the dimensions and measurements to make sure what he is building as a fuel tank eventually will fit into the fuselage frame. This is prototype development. First you build the part, make sure it fits, and then you draw up engineering drawings for further productions. And since Matze mentioned interest in learning how to create an engineering drawing, we might probably in a future episode of our workshop watch show how the fuel tank drawing is developed from start to finish so that you have something of it too. And here Matze is cutting the brass sheets for the fuel tank. And while Matze keeps enjoying the pleasures of building fuel tanks, 
On the other side of the shed, Philip is continuing woodwork on the wing. That is now part of it, you have to get used to it. The camera will always be present. <laughs> Philip is an apprentice with a German sailplane company, a world-renowned company by the name of Schempert. And he has a colleague there, he is also an apprentice, a young man, a refugee from Iran. He came here when he was 14 years old and he also started the apprentice as a light aircraft builder with Schempert. And he also is interested in vintage airplane construction and hence he's here with us too occasionally and gets a glimpse of what it is to build a vintage airplane. And here we see both of them gluing the linen tapes over the glue joints of the main spar. These linen tapes back in the day prevented moisture from getting into the glue joint and dissolving the glue. Today this is no longer necessary but if I don't put those linen tapes onto the spars there's no reason for others to see them and to ask what their purpose is and then I have no reason to explain it. The days fly by and lots gets done. And again I have visitors. This time it's Lars and Werner. One is from Sweden, the other one from Munich also. Both are interested in vintage aircraft construction and since we are a museum which has the intention of showing people how this actually was done hands on. Yeah, they become the historical flugzeug bau, gleich eine doppelte Bedeutung. Richtigen Anstrich. Ich glaube, das historisch war auf dich bezogen, Anna. They asked whether they could come spend the day and help me. So they are here and doing all the work. And now I'm standing in the corner doing nothing, just delegating the work. And since they are neither here on holiday, nor for fun, they also can do some of the hard work. The wingtip bows have been installed over the last few days, and now they have to be trimmed. And that's hard work. And I'm not getting any younger either. So, any file stroke or rasp stroke that they do spares me. So, Hurry up and go ahead. Keep on going. After Matze has cut all the tank mantle sheets, he has to fold the ends for the bedded seams that close the fuel tank eventually. And that's what he's doing here. Easy and gentle, Matze. Don't hurry. Leave the metal its time. Never torture the sheet metal.
Matze, what are you doing? Matze is working on fuel tanks again. <laughs> Matze didn't even notice that the camera was on. And I almost forgot that today is Thai Day. But it's Thai Day. Matze is working on the filler necks. They need holes to be eventually be riveted to the fuel tank mantle. Once this is done, we can roll the tank mantle and start closing it up. And he is doing it just like I told him. Eyeball Mark 1. You don't always have to measure, mark and lay out. We've spoken about it at the beginning of this workshop show. Accuracy. Accuracy where it is required. If you carry on putting holes into that, we end up with a Swiss cheese. The next time you better take the marker. Put small dots where you want to drill. And you don't have to drill where you put your dots. If you see they are not where you want to have your holes, then drill next to your marked points. Compensate. And what did we learn once about riveting and rivet distances? Not more than 10 times the diameter of the rivet. Yep, so if you have a 3 mm rivet, no greater distance between the rivets than 30 mm. But we must not place the holes 5 mm apart. Equally distributed in a sensible way. And in the meantime, Philip continues to rasp the tip bows. He is astonished how much work that is. It's amazing how much must go away, isn't it? You think you're done and still not. Well, keep going until you're there. Oh boy, what a mess. So, what are we up to today? And the wing now has reached the stage in which the plywood leading edge can be pulled on. That's 1.2 mm birch plywood, 3 ply. And how the sheets are laid out and put on, I'll show you now. It all starts with a big enough sheet of plywood. The general dimensions are taken directly off the wing. From where else should I get them? I'm not carrying drawings with me all the time and I don't have the dimensions in my head. And it needs to fit here anyway.
Once the plywood plate is cut to its raw size, the spar is marked to show where the planking has to go. Rib positions and other frame structures underneath the fairing have to be marked directly on the structure itself and to make sure that your plywood plate doesn't slip you have to mark its position so that you can bring it back in any case of slippering. Otherwise top and bottom won't fit together. The plywood sheet is best clamped or fixed in any way to the top structure. You can do this with nails which you don't put in complete, uh, don't drive them in complete and or, or with a clamp like here, this makes sure that the plate doesn't slip on top of the structure and so at least the top can be marked from the inside that way without the risk of putting lines where they don't should be. I should have told myself as the cleaning woman of the museum to broom the floor first. This is what the final product for this section looks like. Let's see if it fits. And following a quadrillion times of double checking and rechecking and comparing again, finally the time has come when all fits and you're confident it fits, that you can start gluing and nailing the top side first. And if it fits, you see eventually when you bend it around and do the underside. Most time it works.
Most important is that there are no voids between the rib cap strips and the plywood leading edge cover. To make sure you have to double check it here I show you how it looks from the inside and as you can see uh, the more lines you draw during measuring and fitting of the part the less boring the assembling gets. This can now sit and rest until the clue is set, that is, for tomorrow. And the remaining rib base of the wing, which still lack the leading edge cover, are treated the same way. The center flap of the leading edge of course has to be tacked down here. I do this as one of the last things, otherwise uh, may happen that the plywood leading edge gets under tension and doesn't lay properly. And this way you can get in with a brush and still varnish the inside. It's a bit tricky, but it works. If that is tacked down already, mm, there's a little little less room for the brush to get in. In this case, you should varnish it beforehand. Just a little bit more work and the wing is done. Then, this year, we've built two wings here, which is quite satisfying. Kann der Winter kommen, wird eh nur noch Metall gemacht. Dann werden dieses Jahr zwei Tragflächen gebaut. Nicht schlecht, Herr Specht. Wie gesagt, hier komme ich so noch mit dem Pinsel besser rein zum Streichen. In the next step we will be working on the hardware of the wing, but we save that for the next episode. One hour is already full again. There's one more thing we can celebrate today. As you may know, Paolo Severin of Italy has built a one third scale large size model 
of the angles E7 from our drawings, which are available elsewhere. Just ask. And his aeroplane, a wingspan of 2 meters, has made its maiden flight on October 13th. And here you have the video featuring that maiden flight doing some aerobatics with this little airplane. For the first time in 104 years, this airplane is seen in the air again. We are looking forward to seeing the full-size planes too. Well, tie day is over. Next tie day we'll have in 25 more episodes with episode 50. In this case, I'm halfway through. Oh boy, if I manage that. One final word for our English-speaking audience. The original German edition of the workshop watch will remain free on YouTube for all to see. The English edition we will transfer with episode 26 completely to Patreon. The museum can use any support it can get. Members on Patreon will get many benefits including the English version of the workshop watch. What? You're interested in aircraft? Well, win.
vintage aircraft, you see. Go on an air show or in a museum where you can see them. No? You're interested in how they are made? Well, in this case, you're right here. The Museum of Aircraft Construction and Technical History can show you every little bit. Join us on Patreon and watch all the little details. Every nut, every bolt, video clips, drawings, Photograph sets showing how these things are made. There you are. I invite you to come to our Patreon page and have a look at it all. Und das war sie auch schon wieder, die Werkstattschau des Museums für Flugzeugbau und Technische Geschichte in Weschenbeuren. Besuchen Sie uns doch mal. Jeden ersten Samstag im Monat von 9 bis 18 Uhr geöffnet. Museum für Flugzeugbau und Technische Geschichte in Weschenbeuren. Wir freuen uns auf Ihren Besuch.